My scripture today comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 61. Yes, I'm aware it's a large passage, but I thought you should hear this story. First Kings chapter 8, beginning in the 22nd verse, says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. He said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or in the earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants, who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant my father David that which you have promised him. Indeed, you have spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David my father that which you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way and walk before me as you have walked. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word, I pray, be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Yet I have regarded to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray towards this place. Listen to the supplication your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, hear and forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are defeated, before an enemy, because they have sinned against you. If they turn to you again, and confess your name, and pray, and make supplication to you in this house, then hear from heaven, and forgive the sin of your people Israel, and bring them back to the land which you gave their fathers. When the heavens are shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against you, and they pray toward this place, and confess your name, and turn from their sin, when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and your people Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given your people for an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence, if there is blight or mildew or locusts or grasshopper, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, Whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and spreading his hands toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you have given to our fathers. Also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, and for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls you in order that all the peoples of the earth 
may know your name, to fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. When your people go out to battle against their enemies, by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord for the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built in your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them into the enemy, so that they are taken away captive to a land of the enemy far off or near. And if they take thought in the land where they have been taken captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land, those who have taken them captive, saying, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have acted wickedly. If they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who have taken them captive and pray to you toward their land which you have given them, their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built on your name. Then hear their prayer, their supplication in heaven in your dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you, and make them objects of compassion before those who have taken them captive, and that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your inheritance, through which you have brought forth from Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. And your eyes may be opened to their supplication, your servant and the supplication of your people Israel, to listen to them whenever they call to you. For you have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance, as you spoke through Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers forth from the land of Egypt, O Lord our God. And when Solomon had finished praying the entire prayer and supplication to the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord and from kneeling on his knees with hands spread toward heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed is the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all he promised. Not one word has failed for all his good promises which he promised through Moses his servant. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances which he commanded our fathers. And may these words of mine, which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the Lord, now all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no one else. Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord God and walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as this day. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. My message today is entitled Prayer, Part 1, which of course you know what that means. There's going to be more later. Prayer is something that's talked about a lot in Scripture and in our modern world. Matter of fact, there's 195 references to Scripture in Scripture of prayer. And throughout the Bible, there are many such prayers that men and women of God make. Here we have heard one such prayer, the prayer of King Solomon at the dedication of the temple of the Lord God in Jerusalem. You see, Solomon's father, David, had been a mighty warrior and had brought the nation of Israel together into one nation and conquered his enemies, and established a land and a kingdom. He was a man after God's own heart, and God loved him greatly. But because he was a man of war and his hands had been covered with blood, God decided that he would not be the one to build the temple, and that task would fall to his son Solomon. And now Solomon has fulfilled that promise made to David and has built the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And here at the dedication ceremony, 
King Solomon comes before the Lord and falls on his knees and lifts his arm in prayer for the people. A very long, long prayer. Like so many others in the New Testament. Now, of course, as Jesus has said, a prayer's length isn't necessarily indicative of his quality. For Jesus described Pharisees going and saying long-winded prayers so they could be heard and seen by men, whereas the sinner goes into a closet and shuts the door and says, God save me. And Jesus says, whose prayer do you think was heard that day? I'll tell you the man who went into the closet and prayed and confessed his sins before the Lord. But here, Moses, I mean, excuse me, Solomon goes before the Lord and the people to express and pray for them and to show them the great works that God has done and to ask God to be with them through everything. Because God wants prayer. His churches are, and His temple, and now His churches are to be houses of prayer. We, we talked from, at the beginning of the service today, our opening scripture was from Mark 11, 16 and 17. It says, He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds. And He began to teach and say to them, is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. His house would be a house of prayer. And not just for the Jews, but for all people. You heard even Solomon say, concerning the foreigner who's come from a far country for your namesake, because they will hear about the great and mighty name of the Lord. Hear their prayer too. And you see, when Jesus came into the temple and cleansed it, and overturned the tables of the money changers and drove them out, is because they had set up shop selling the doves for the offerings and changing the currency from the secular currency into the Jewish currency in the area where the Gentiles were supposed to pray because the, the way the, the temple was set up you had the temple building and then the outside you had the inner court where the Jews could pray and then you had the outer court the court of the women and then the final outside area was the what they called the court of the Gentiles and that's where people like you and me who were not Jews could come to the outside area and pray. And all these money changers and sellers of doves had set up shop out there, and so the poor Gentiles couldn't pray. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You know, this is supposed to be an area of prayer, and here you are ripping off people and stealing their money in this very area. And so he got mad and flipped over all the tables and told them to get out. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds because it was a holy place of prayer. Prayer is a lot of things. And we're going to talk about some of the different things about it over the next week or so. It is, at its most basic, communication with God with God the Father, with God the Holy Spirit, with God the Son, Jesus Christ. Here, Solomon lays out various situations in life that you might need prayer for. You might need prayer when we've turned away from God and done wicked things. And, and Solomon, like Jesus would later tell, says that for there is no man who does not sin. Everybody sins. So everybody needs to ask forgiveness of God. And not just once, 
I mean, every time. I mean, yes, if you believe in Jesus Christ and accept Him as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit enters you, and you are saved, sealed with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean you won't sin again. You might be tempted and fall again, maybe several times in your life. And each time, once you realize what you've done, you should go to the Lord and ask forgiveness. For He is faithful and just to forgive our sin. When you're in quarrels with your neighbor, when a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes before, then pray to God that God's judgment might be done, both you and toward your neighbor. When things go wrong in your life, here they talk about famine, pestilence, mildew, grasshoppers, locusts. When things go sideways, who are you going to call? It's not the Ghostbusters. It's, it's God. You need to be first and foremost in seeking His help and advice and guidance. Too many of us, something comes up, oh, we're going to, and we'll try whatever to fix it. And sometimes, you know, it works out. But a lot of times we'll do stuff and it doesn't help. And then, oh, and then find out, oh, well then let's pray about it. Yeah, well, should have done that in the first place. Started with there. And maybe our, our actions may have been more successful. God will forgive us of our sins. And the infliction of our own hearts when we spread our hands toward the Lord in His house. Where can we pray? Well, you can pray anywhere. You especially can pray here in God's house. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, He opened the door. The temple the curtain in the temple was torn in two and the Holy of Holies was no longer separated from the rest of the world because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He told the woman at the well at Samaria, neither in Jerusalem or on this mountain will they worship me. Because the place doesn't matter anymore because anywhere can now be a holy place. Only that those who worship me, worship me in what? Spirit and in truth. You can go to God anywhere. Here, in your car, at your job, in your home, on your boat. A lot of prayers take place on boats in the Bible. We've seen that a whole bunch. From Jonah, he even did it in the belly of a whale. So, you know, any location is a good location. Um, but yes yes you should prayer you know we've got to build that relationship it's hard to be in a relationship when you don't talk to the other person you know it's kind of kind of cold you know you got that friend you hadn't called in you know months and months and then you call them and it's awkward. And yeah, well, that's the way a lot of times it can be for us. Now God, being totally loving and forgiving, is always, always waiting. Always waiting by the phone, as, you, as we used to joke about teenagers. God's sort of like that in a way. God describes it in the parable of the prodigal son. God, rep God is represented by the Father in that story. You know, the son went off and spent all his money and ended up in the pig pen and one day comes to his senses and decides to go back and 
you know, be his father's servant. And he goes, and the scriptures tell him that his father saw him while he was still yet far off. Why? Because the father was looking. He was waiting. He'll be back. He'll come back. He's there with open arms saying, put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet and a robe about him. He's there to lift us up when we hit the bottom of the pigsty. He's there to put a robe around us when we've been caught, exposed, naked, because of our immorality, like the woman caught in adultery. God loves us and wants to be with us both now and throughout all eternity. That's why He came. And that's why He hears and cares about us and our prayers. So today pray. Pray all the time. None of us pray enough. I don't care who you are. I don't, you don't, nobody does. We can always pray more. Try to make time. Try to give all your thoughts and troubles and pains and lay them at his feet. Take up his yoke. It's a lot lighter. And now we're going to engage in one of the rituals of the church, one of the ordinances, <coughs> the Lord's Supper. It's also called what? Communion. To be together at the Lord's table. You want conversation? You want good conversation? Have a meal together. Am I right? God knows. That's why he had a table. And he said, look, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. But this is our table for now until we all sit together around the table of the Lord in heaven. Let us have this conversation, this prayer of the bread, of the fruit of the vine. And may the Lord's body and blood cleanse us of our iniquities. Let us come to the table.